Okay, just uh, to start off this class, um, just from we at the end of the last class we were discussing uh, divergences in open string theory, and we realized that the bosonic open string did have use UV divergences, but that light for well in a different way from the closed string, these these UV divergences were um, interpretable as IR effects in the closed string side. Now, there was some unhappiness about this interpretation effect. It's a good thing, right? So, let's just spend five or ten more minutes on this just to, just to clear up all this unhappiness. You see, uh, uh, before looking at the uh, uh, physical interpretation, just look at, let's look at the technique we put Okay, what did we have? We had this, this uh, uh, strip partition function, which we then integrated over module. That was the thing that we, we obtained. Okay, now um, we were interested. The, the, the troublesome divergences, the troublesome divergences, happened in the limit of very high temperature. From this point of view, because of the UV, <coughs> very high temperature means very small beta, so very small size of the strip. So this this thing we call T, so very small T. Is this clear? So if you know, we obtained from a world sheet of this form, but this side is much longer than this. Okay, now this is the regime in which in quantum field theory it's very difficult to directly calculate a partition function. Because it's a regime in which many different states contribute to the partition. Okay? So the direct calculation which we have in the exact thing, we could analyze that mathematically and we need using module embeddings. But actually, our analysis of it mathematically uh, has a has a just before we integrate over the space, just as function of t, uh, has a physical counterpart. See, so what we did in order to analyze this was use modular a modular transformation of this partition function. So that was purely mathematical analysis, okay? But in the end, we got the answer in terms of s, which was one by t. Now, you see, because we're dealing in a conformal field here, every partition function that we calculate is invariant under uniform rescalings. So this object here is the same thing as let's take this side and rescale it to be of size 2 pi. Okay? And then, okay, so let's first draw this way. So this is, is the same thing as just a level of world sheet conform. Okay, this is a circle. This is a circle of size 2 pi. And this is a, uh, is, a, is, is a strip of length uh, 1 over t, or 2 pi, 4 pi squared, something like that. More about that. Yeah. Okay? So this is, uh, okay? Where at, uh, uh, where at these edges, we put particular boundary conditions. Mathematical level, the 
of integral that calculated the open string partition function can also be represented okay, as a particular closed string state created properly at a lower time t and annihilated by the same closed string. What this state is, okay, that's a maybe enough course describe. This, this by the way is called the boundary state. The state B is called the boundary state. It's a closed string representation of open string non recognitions. Okay? And uh, it's much a much studied object, and there's a lot to say about it. But that's it's not our purpose at this point to discuss the boundary state. Again, we, 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 we can worry about, you know, it's actually not difficult to give an explicit oscillator representation of the state and so on. Uh, for open string non recognitions, it's a nice and interesting subject, which we probably return to. Uh, uh, does, it, does this boundary condition violate the local symmetry? Does the boundary condition violate? Yeah, so the boundary, this, this state is not invariant under all the beta sort of generators, that's what you're asking. Yeah. Okay, but it is invariant under half of them. Right. Effectively, for the same reason that the open string boundary conditions were broken, half of them are. Yeah. yeah, so it's the same. Symmetry analysis is the same. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. You see, any state in any quantum field theory, the vacuum, well, most quantum field theories, vacuum is the most symmetric state in the problem. We get any other state, it will not be invariant under all the symmetries of the theory. That's not an unusual situation. It's not a bad thing for a state to be invariant under fewer symmetries than the theory. Most states are. Okay? Uh, why don't we then do like open string and why don't we then instead of looking at scattering matrices only for open strings, why don't we deal with general, uh, I mean, instead of dealing with S matrices and where the I think where we are only looking at asymptotic states for uh, for open strings. Why don't we, I mean, impose such a boundary condition and look at scattering matrices at time? You see, the, we mustn't confuse a uh, world sheet with space time. Okay. Everything we're talking about here is world sheet. Yeah. Okay? Right. So we're looking at finite, a partition function with finite distance on the world sheet. We did this even for the closed string. We computed the partition function of the closed string at finite tau. For the same reason that you didn't complain there, you should complain here. This is a purely auxiliary world sheet calculation. Okay? It's, we're not saying that uh, computing st scattering of states from one localized point in space time to another. We're not doing that. Yeah. We can never do that. At least when closed strings come. You know, in the some limit by open strings decoupled from closed strings, then in that sense we can. But we don't know how to do that in string theory in any sense in any sense in whenever closed strings come to the open string. Okay? But that's not what we do. We just take the partition function of the world sheet and analyze it in a purely, you know, just looking at that path of table and giving it another interpretation. Same path table. Is this clear? Okay? Now, because this is the transition amplitude from one state to another state, okay? Because it's transition amplitude from one state to another state, we can insert complete set of states in the middle. It's uh, convenient to insert a complete set of eigenstates because then the eigenstates will propagate to free. Okay? So, suppose we could insert a complete set of closed string eigenstates, let's call them M, we get D M times M B okay, times e to the power minus E M by D. Or let's call that E M S. Where well, EMS are the closed string uh, states are propagated the string. Okay? So, as long as we are interested purely in the analysis of the of the of the uh, conformal field theory, which is the uh, world sheet partition function, there must be some numbers yeah, for which this is true. So if we are interested in the limit of very large S, this is a useful representation. Because at the lowest energy states that have non zero overlap. Well, no. You see, as at some point last time the question came up why do we get the number 24 if you remember the master states? It's because only 24 of these states have non zero. So, yeah, that, that's this. Oh, though we're not getting into that in detail now. That's an uh, interesting but large subject of its own, the standard boundary states. Okay? Now, you see, this is. So, what was the key point? The key point was that 
in a purely mathematical analysis, we had dt by some blah blah blah, which turned into just simple ds times exponentials. Okay? So that tells us that positive exponentials are constants for problems. Right? Because we were living in the limit of logics, yeah? So positive exponentials are constants for problems, negative exponentials were not. Okay. So firstly, just purely from the just in conformal field theory, when you get a positive exponential, you get a positive exponential if you have a closed field vacuum. Okay? So positive exponentials, which are a problem, are an artifact of having a closed field vacuum, and so we'll never bother. Okay? Now, then there's the next question. What about the constants? Okay? Now, the constants are there, provided you have the closed string constant states. Okay? And that will always be there. Extra. Okay? So, this tells us, firstly, the nature of the problem of UV divergences. The nature of the problem of UV divergences, okay? The nature of the problem of UV divergences is that, that well, it, it will arise whenever you have a closed string tachyon, or will arise when we have closed string constant states, provided that these states couple to this function. Okay? Now, we are going to deal eventually with string theories that have no tachyon. So, we are not going to do the analysis with the tachyon. Okay? The tachyon is problematic for many reasons. Let's look at that. But, what, but, but of course, we are going to deal with, uh, with closed string theories that, theories that do have massless states. Okay? So, the massless states you can't dispose of. So what's the other alternative? The other alternative is that the massless states don't couple to our matrix. That, that, that the full state of the theory, whatever it is, okay, does not source the graph. Okay, or the or, or the data. Now, this sourcing is what? You see, from a closed string point of view. Any diagram involving open strings can also be thought of from this closed string point of view. So if you have some, uh, if you have some vertex operators inserted here, that would change this boundary. That's it, right? Something else going on. Okay. So from the closed string point of view, this uh, 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 this 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 diagram, this thing represents the amplitude for a closed string to be created by. Strings. Look at that statement diagrammatically. You see, what is it? It's the amplitude. You see, it was the amplitude that in this boundary state you find a particular closed string. When you propagate the boundary state, you find a particular closed string. Right? So that is the same thing as this diagram. You take this boundary state, this particular, this, and you propagate it away. To instead of this boundary state, to that particular closed string of interest. Okay? Now, since that closed string of interest is an eigenstate, that can live on a cylinder of any length. So let's take the length of that cylinder to be infinite with the closed string. Data. But now we can conform the transformation, get this tube down to the disk. So this is the same thing as this operator. Okay, this object is the same thing as the one point function of the vertex operator corresponding to that state inserted on the disk. Okay, so we've concluded that we're going to have this problem. Whenever we have non zero one point functions of massless closed string states inserted on the disk, these, these one point functions are called poles. Okay. And so far, everything that I've said is just purely mathematical analysis to conform. Okay, I've not mentioned space time so far. Okay, so clear, just purely at the mathematical level, we say that in order to have consistent open string theory, namely open string diagrams with no unit divergences, we want to cancel all closed string massless temples. We want to, we want to deal with a theory which has no massless closed string. I say cancel. 
Okay? I say cancel because, as you will see as you go along, uh, there, there are some ambiguous there are elements, things you can add to your background. And you can choose combinations of them that are added up so that the scatter code is cancelled. All you're saying is, you know, we can write to this uh, this open stream uh, uh, partition function in such a way that we have this combination where uh, there's an overlap between the open uh, between the closed stream states and the boundary states. Yeah. And you're claiming that uh, the constant uh, for the massless case, the constant uh, part which gives rise to one of the divergences that would be zero because of uh, uh, because of this absence of backwards. Is that? I'm saying that if we could find the string theory where that is zero, okay? Okay, then, then, then we will not have the problem of UP divergence. Then that 24 term will also not appear. Will not appear? Yeah. Okay? It will not appear. At the mathematical level, what we would say is that there's no divergences. But I'm giving you a more, an, an alternate way of characterizing. The alternate characterization is that if you find a theory where the disk, there are no, no tag poles, at order 1 by g, in the disk or any other diagram that contributes in the same order. We'll, maybe I should discuss orient folds in which but, but, but there'll be orient, orient fold diagrams. Orient folds will cancel the that's, 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 the, that's the answer to your question. But uh, we'll, uh, my plan was to first complete the discussion of open strings and go back to orient folds. Maybe I should have you know, not done it in that order. But anyway. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but, uh, uh, you know, okay. So, if we can find a background in which these stack codes are zero, then we know we will not have problems with UV divergence in the ocean. It's the only statement that's going to be. This statement is non trivial because we will deal with backgrounds with zero tag. So, then we will not bother at that point to check whether the open string one loop divergence vanishes or not because we guarantee that it will be. Is this clear? Now, in the last part of the last time lecture, I try to say this more physically from the point of view of space time. So far, everything we've done is just mathematics, and it's hard to argue. You can't argue with mathematics, so it's correct. Okay? Now I'm going to give you a physical interpretation from the point of view of space time. So you can separate these two things if you want. Okay? The physical interpretation weighted as follows. You see, what is a dead portal? What is this diagram? It represents a one point function of some state. Okay? So in a Lagrangian, you know, we know that the states that we need to have some kind of data. So suppose you had a pretend they scale, nothing changed, nothing essential changed. Okay? So suppose you had some action which had d mu phi over x squared plus n squared phi squared. If you have a one point function, it's at this level, so that's a factor of g. Okay, so copy across it. So you have some g times phi. Okay, now we have to understand two things. We have to understand the point. You see, it was not, not a problem if we had that goes for massive states. Because they appear with a negative exponential. They never gave rise to that. Okay? So we have to understand two things. We have to understand why tadpoles are bad for massive states, but they're okay for massive states. Okay, this is going to be now physical interpretation. So the physical interpretation runs as follows. Look at this space time diverge. Okay, now this was zero volume term. Quantum effects, some coupling constant effects, gives you a small additional g times phi. What was the vacuum of this theory? Just guess again. Vacuum of this theory was phi equals zero. What is the vacuum of this theory? It's phi is equal to whatever. Right, Minus g by 2 m squared. Everywhere in space. You get it by completing the square. It's not phi is equal to 0, it's phi is equal to some shifted value. But who cares? It's a small difference, small shifted value. Is this clear? Because g is a small number. The original potential of our theory was like this. Now you've added a linear term to that. So depending on the sign, the linear term shifts in some direction. So it's like that. But this is not very different. It's not very different from that. Okay, breaks five goes to minus five. But that, but it's not a drastic change. It's got it. The new vacuum is, in some sense, close to the old vacuum. Okay, so you can deal with the effects of this term in perturbation. It's a small change on the.
the old situation. Is this clear? Now, let's, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, mathematically, how would you analyze this? You would analyze this by saying, well, well firstly, we should probably be more careful if we want to do that. Um, yeah. Minus. Minus here, right? Minus of the overall. Minus of the overall. Okay, yeah, that's the minus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So mathematically, what we, what we would have said is, let's say we're searching for translation in vacuum. Right? Now we solve the equation of motion, the equation of motion times squared phi, with a 2 plus g is equal to 0. Okay, and then we solve that with the phi and whatever it is. Now, on the other hand, suppose we say n equals 0. Suddenly, we see that the equation has no solutions. Has no solutions because the equation is then just g is equal to 0, which is not true. Okay? So that tells us that there are no translational invariant solutions of this theory with a dipole pole in the field's mass. It's not true that there are no solutions at all. Because there are solutions. But the, the, the solutions will have a balance of this del, you know, del squared phi against constant. We need del squared is equal to a constant. One way to solve this, for instance, phi to be a linear function of the quadrant. That sometimes happens in Mahogany. But this is a big change in the theory. Okay? For instance, even if your vacuum here is not very much changed, you go far enough away, it's changed very much. Okay? Which tells you that if you try to do perturbation theory, you will have problems at long distances. Because there's no sense in which the change in your in your theory can be thought of as small everywhere. Over a local patch, it doesn't change very much. And this is phi is changing linearly with x. But the slope is very small, so you can ignore it over a local patch. When that patch becomes a model 1 over g, you can't ignore it anymore, you can run into trouble. Perturbation theory always breaks down if you assume that you've started that. You know, when does perturbation theory break down? If the theory is well enough. It breaks down for a number of reasons, the most common of which is that your starting point is not near the right solution. If you do perturbation theory thinking, well, let's do perturbation in, in G. But you start with a solution that's far away from the right thing. That won't work. And that's what you're doing. Is this clear? This is the philosophy of the space time. Now, what is the mathematics of the space time? The mathematics of the space time thing is almost trivial, but anyways, worth seeing is the following. Suppose you want to calculate a one loop graph in space time. You know, this vacuum, not one loop, sorry, the vacuum engine graph. There's a diagram that goes like this. With two copies of insertions of this and one propagator. You see, this the answer to this diagram is the inverse of the propagator. Okay. But by translational invariance, the only momentum that goes in here is zero. So the inverse of the propagator, the propagator P at momentum equals zero. Okay, what is the momentum flowing through this? It's zero. Which is fine if the particles are massive. One over m squared, but is infinite if the particle is massless. Okay? So you see immediately that in this trivial quadratic theory, if you try to compute the vacuum energy, you would have a graph that would give you. Okay? It's coming from this particle propagating over very long distances. Well, all distances. But okay. It's, it's, it's some graph that gives you just infinity. And it's symptom of trying to do perturbation theory about the wrong background. Actually, typically speaking, perturbation theory breaks down for two reasons. Firstly, if you're doing it around the wrong background. Or secondly, if you're asking the wrong question. Typically, these are two typical reasons. And in this case, uh, we just did perturbation theory with the wrong background. It's not, not true that this theory makes no sense. There is some background, some translation non invariant background, around which if you did perturbation theory, everything would be fine. Okay? But that's not what we're doing in string theory. We're taking this closed string to propagate about that space. And then when you do perturbation theory, you get the analog of this problem. So what did you actually, actually mean when you said you're asking the wrong question? What did I actually mean? I have in mind infrared divergences of gauge theories. You know, you should, you should be uh, doing some inclusive kind of calculation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the, 
the uh, now the last thing that I said last time, okay, which again we should keep in mind, is the following. Suppose uh, what I want to do is diagnose that this problem is exactly the analog of this problem. They look similar, but how do I know they're really exactly the same? So one way to do that is to change this question a little bit. If you somehow manage to inject some way into it, into this vertex here, you somehow manage to do that. You know, you make this this tan pole not translationally invariant. That's how you do it. If this thing here had some momentum, this g was a function of x and had some momentum in it, then this vertex would break translation invariance. Right, then g of function of space time. Okay? And then we look at the differentiate with respect to g of k. Is it supposed to pass as a function of space time supported at some value of k? It's replace g by g times equal to the power i k x. Plus complex object, perhaps. Okay? Then the same diagram, everything would go through in prime diagram mathematics except that this vertex operator. Would, you know, momentum conservation would say that there's a jump in momentum between here and here. Here there's no momentum. Here there must be momentum k. And therefore, we would get 1 over k squared. Is this clear? There would no longer be a divergence. Would be a finite answer. It's hard to compare infinity with infinity. It's easier to compare finite numbers. So that's the motivation. Is this clear? So what we want to do is to check whether in string theory we do get this 1 over k squared if we change the closed string source to have some space back away. Okay? Is this clear? Now, what was the closed string source? The closed string source was the boundary statement. What do we, how do we change this closed string source to have some space back momentum? Well, we put some vertex operator on the disk and give it an e to the power k x dependence. Clearly, that's now a source that has a specific momentum k. Okay? Therefore, what the question we're asking is that if we do the same calculation now, not with the vacuum, but with some disk, some insertions of the disk, whose net momentum is k, the details of the insertions shouldn't matter. As long as the net momentum is k, the leading divergence here should get smoothened out to a 1 by k square. That would be a test of whether our interpretation of the divergence in open string theory was correct. A closed string interpretation. With space time. The mathematics, the first part of what I said, is unaffected by this, but just the physical interpretation from the point of view of space time. Okay? So, last time I outlined to you that this does happen. The basic point was that when you put some vertex operator here, vertex operator here, in addition, to the, uh, uh, I mean, you, you need to contract these vertex operators. That gives you z12 to the power k squared. z12, you know, because this side is so much smaller than this length, to lowest order, you know, the large s limit, is, um, is essentially e to the power s. So you get an additional e to the power minus s times k squared. So the term that was a constant here that represented the propagation of Nasser's force becomes a negative exponential. The, the coefficient of that exponential is k squared. So when we do the integral over all s, we get 1 over k squared. Okay? We do the integral 0 to infinity to the power minus k squared s, and the answer is 1 by k squared. In this case, they actually had an equation which, which is telling us that there's no, I mean, that we are doing something wrong. In which case? Uh, in, the, in the case of this field theory. Yes. So, so what would be a corresponding equation in that case? I say that you know, we are, you know, not. You see, the, 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 the corresponding equation, yeah. Yeah, the divergence is one symptom of this. Now, how do I, how would I know what, uh, which equation should I solve to get the correct right factor? Which equation should I solve? If I let's say yeah, if I okay, okay. with getting translation non invariant. Okay, very good, very good question. You see, the, what what was the condition that we had initially? Okay, that we actually had a had a good background of string theory. 
Well, I mean, why the 26 dimensions were for them? Why the 25? The condition was conformal in maintenance uh, with C equals A. And of course, flat space string theory with, with boundary conditions is conformally in maintenance to C equals A. Now, you see, that was the condition for having a valid classical solution of string theory. That condition, the condition of conformal invariance, is modified when you take into account loop effects. Okay? Which is basically in the statement of real theory that if you've got some vacuum uh, of a classical action, that may not be the correct vacuum of the quantum function. Okay? The way this happens is what's called the Fischler Suskin mechanism. Okay? Where, you see, there are two sources of divergences now. The there's divergences when uh, uh, there are two kinds of divergences. One that happen when vertex operators hit small loops in the integrate. There's new divergences of a certain sort. Okay, again, we'll get to this. But there are new divergences of a certain sort in the integration of the modular space, which can be absorbed into world sheet, which becomes sort of effectively local on the world sheet, and can be absorbed into world sheet divergence. So then the correct condition, when you look at string theory as you go order by order in perturbation in the coupling constant expansion, okay, is to solve some equations that at lowest order are the conditions for conformal invariance of the world shape theory, but at higher order the string coupling okay, are some deformed equations that are not quite the condition of conformal invariance. Now, the question is whether these deformed equations have a solution. Those deformed equations are the angle of this. Okay, in this, okay, in this particular case, what is the field which will become trash? I mean, which will develop, uh, where, I don't know whether the question will make sense. Which will develop, uh, uh, oh, you're asking, what is the, uh, huh, what is the, uh, it's the, but one, 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 one thing that many things go into, but one thing that, 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 that uh, the dilaton is one such. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the final answer to string theory on this on this background would be well, one particular solution. Okay. I'm not sure it's unique. It's probably not. But one particular solution is a linear dilaton. Okay. That, that's a known exact theory that would do, would do the job. Okay. With a linear dilaton. Okay. So that was your question. That was easier. Okay. We we postpone the discussion. We should just ask again. Okay. Yeah. Good. Other questions or comments on this? It's, we're, we're spending time on it, I know, but it's important because these are, you know, the important conceptual issues of quantum history. Other questions or comments about it? If you have any questions or comments, please. Okay, okay. Uh, say if it is, is there some way of saying, saying that, you know, this, this particular uh, state is actually sourcing it and we are not forming, I mean, in this case, the, 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 you know, we can, if we want it, we can physically interpret these equations that you know G is something like a source, and you know you're not following the equations. Right. Okay. I mean, there's a source, and there's a there's a quantum by quantum mechanics, there's an effective source. Right. And, yeah. 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 And, and and you know, like you're not following it correctly if you're just saying phi is translation equation. Exactly. So here, you know, like I mean, is there is there some way of understanding that you know, like this is actually sourcing the mass? Yeah. You see, that's the that pool diagram. When, when you know that you have a source, see, if you're about a true solution to the equation of motion, there are all one-point functions. As you. So if you've got a one-point function in your theory, you've not solved it. Okay? So that's this. This calculates one-point functions. Now, though that's too slick, because it does not differentiate between whether these one-point functions can be removed by small changes of the vacuum. You see, you would have a one point function whether or not there was a mass here. But if the mass was something finite, then though the one point function existed, you weren't working around the right background, the correct background was not following. Okay? In fact, the mass of that was here would shift. Would just shift the, the negative exponentials.
There's no sense in pushing C. There's no sense in pushing C. Okay. It's a, this, 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 the fact that you can view things in different channels of the global world sheet. It's called the um, world sheet duality. And it's a very important property for the industry. Okay. Which, as we have seen, has space effect. Okay, good. Other questions about it? Fine. Okay, so if everyone's happy with all of this, now let, then let's move on to uh, 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 to the study. Okay, now we move, we're moving on to chapter. So we finished our discussion of chapter 7, apart from the discussion of orientables, which in my plan I'm going to get to right at the end of this this month, you know, just before we have your, your exam. Uh, I want to discuss open string theories first, then ramifications, and then orient folds last. So for the point of, from the point of view of that poor cancellation, we may should maybe should that. But anyway, let's stick to this plan for now. So the last thing that we want to do in our discussion of open string theories is chapter eight. Okay, of question key, just to royal compactification of string. Okay? So those are the so one of the reasons I'm discussing the logical compactifications is that it will lead us to new phenomena involving open strings. Namely, lead us to understanding deep rates. The discussion of the logical compactification starts in the absence of open strings. You know, you don't need to have open strings to discuss the logical compactifications of any, any theory of gravity, string theory. So let's start by discussing the logical compactifications. Without open strings, we we'll add them in that message. Okay? So, the theory we want to discuss is the theory in which we've got x0 and then xi, i is equal to 1 to 24, and then xd, let's x25. And we break the Lorentz symmetry of the theory by choosing one of the, one of the coordinates. At a later point, we will generalize this to having more. So we start with just one, maybe at 25, and maybe bigger. Okay? So we want to, our goal is to study string theory in this time. Okay. Now, maybe one quick statement about what this means. Uh, before beginning a systematic study. Um, as you've seen, x25 is a field. Whereas r is a number. Okay? So what this means is that the zero mode of x25 is bigger. Whereas all the oscillator modes of the, th of the, of the theory are unaffected. Okay? So this periodicity is a statement about the periodicity of the zero mode of the theory. For instance, suppose I took the theory on a circle of length to pi doing and so we are expanding it. The periodicity, the, 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 the statement is that the, the constant piece is not a single value field in space time. Okay? Whereas the oscillators are just totally unaffected by this. Okay, this is always something to keep in mind. The toroidal compactification, what it does from the point of view of string theory, is a change the zero mode sector, leaving everything else unaffected. Okay, so we will soon be studying string theory with, with this thing compact. But before doing that, we should start. Uh, I, I wanted, I wasn't sure you guys were all completely familiar with this. Um, I wanted to quickly review how just the theory of low energy gravity, okay, uh, coupled with the scalar fields and a BB mu field, okay, would uh, react to the right Okay, uh, here, here, R is somewhat large enough. It's any number. When we start string theory, it will be any number. Then how does it compare with the first mass of the it, it's, it's arbitrary. Okay, at, the, at this point it's arbitrary. It could be made equal to that, could be made smaller than that, could be made larger. Okay, we'll say that at the level of classical string theory, this is a solution to the equation to motion from all So it's just a number that it ends. Okay, but uh, there'll be many things to say about this as we Okay? But to start with, imagine that R is big. Okay? And we forget about the tachyon because it won't be that it's so strange. So that uh, the effective space-time action 
the space will just be the massless modes of the theory, okay, uh, on on uh, on uh, on the server. Okay, so what we're going to discuss is the physics of what's called Kaluza time reduction. Okay, uh, you have some familiar, familiarity with this, I'm sure. But anyway, let's discuss it in as thorough fashion as we can, uh, because it's important to understand what effects are just from field theory before we look at the new effects. Okay, so what is the action we discuss? So consider a theory with in okay. So I'll follow Kuchinsky's conventions and use the symbols M N to denote indices that run over all 26 dimensions, whereas the symbols mu will be used to denote indices uh, that run over the non compact
La, no, this is a function of x mu, not x mu. It's mu. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's no restriction to the function. Is this fair? This is a fine reparameterization of Hatsia. Now, under this reparameterization, various things will change. Okay? Let's see what happens here. You see, the metric will change as a metric does on the coordinate transformations. Okay? But there's a very easy way to see how you know how, how things change. You see, under the after we make our change of metric, change of coordinates and change of metric, the uh, line element remains in there. What change in this new parameterization will leave the line element in there? Well, so g mu will go to some new function g mu prime, but that's not changing, right? Because dx mu dx mu is not changing its coordinate. Okay? e to the part 2 sigma will go to some new function e to the part 2 sigma prime, but that's not changing because the dx e squared term, which is here, is not changing. Okay? But a mu will go to some new function a mu prime, and that is changing because dx d goes to dx d plus del mu of lambda times dx mu. So we can absorb that shift into a shift of a mu, which is a mu prime, which is equal to a mu minus del mu.
and say that sum of rank i m is the part 2 pi i x d by and the most general food. Okay. Now with, with this decomposition, what I want to do, okay, is to compute the effective action for chi in the lower direction. So this chi m now is a function of x. Okay? It's clear from momentum conservation that chi m will cover chi m dagger. So this whole action here will we'll have terms with sum over n that can be dagger. What was the period of the XD? It was R. Oh, so. Yeah, XD was R. It was 2 pi, so, so no pi. No pi. Okay. Okay. And then there's an end Okay, now we're supposed to take this and divide it by 
them by the determinant of the metric. No. So this is equal to e to the power minus 2 sigma times that. Okay? So it's equal to uh, e to the power minus 2 sigma plus a1 squared minus a1 minus a1 and 1. Okay? Now it's of course very easy to guess the generalization of this. So if we were in arbitrary dimensions and so on. Okay, what we have is that GDD is equal to e to the power minus 2 sigma plus a mu squared. Where every time you're now contracting, this is a contract with the lower dimension metric. Okay, GD, GD mu is equal to uh, minus a mu. Okay, and G alpha beta. Let me take um, take the original action. Let me work in Euclidean in space. We have del time del square root g. Um, then uh, del m chi del m chi g m n, and write out the terms. So what we have, we've got integral e to the power 2 uh, sigma times square root little g times, now there's one term where the m indices are both mu, so that's just d mu chi, d mu chi, g mu. That's just the usual kinetic term in lower dimension space. There's one term where one index on chi is a mu index, and the other index is a d index. Okay? So this becomes d mu chi to the factor of 2. d mu chi d d chi times g mu d, which we've seen as minus a. Okay? And then there's the last term, in which both of these indices are d. Okay? So we get plus d d chi d d chi times this stuff, which was e to the power minus 2 sigma plus h. Okay. But this thing we did as integral e to the power sigma squared g times, now I define a new derivative. Let me define d mu is equal to del mu plus a mu times del mu. Or oh, minus minus. Can you see that this term, this term, and this term combine together to give me d mu chi, d mu chi. And what we're left with in addition is plus del d chi with d to the power minus. Okay? 
I mean, it's easy to convince yourself the reason that this derivative appeared is that E is the derivative that transforms covariantly under the gauge transformation that became the gauge derivative downstairs. How do you see that? You see, d mu under the change of variables xd goes to xd plus lambda. How does d mu transform? d mu picks up an extra factor of derivative of lambda with respect to mu. Right? You see, it's while xd is the guy that's being changed, in variable changes, in the derivative, downstairs derivative changes, it's x mu that picks up the extra term, the d mu that picks up the extra term. Right? From the chain rule. Right, so what I'm saying is that uh, d mu prime is equal to d mu plus d x uh, d uh, lambda by d Directly in our Kaluza Klein ansatz, 
If we say directly cut up groups at line arms out, you know, with nothing really, nothing depended on that XP field at all, then at least we're coupling to scalar fields. This gauge field is nothing that is that it's charged. I and mean, nothing's charged under this gauge field. However, when we allow dependencies in this additional direction, things are charged under this gauge field, and the role of charge is played by the momentum in the extra direction. Okay? It's clear that the momentum in the extra direction is conserved, because momentum is always conserved. Okay? That maps to the fact that charge is conserved, is necessarily conserved when coupling to gauge field. It's clear that the momentum in the extra direction is quantized. And that turns out that what we've got is a compact you want. You know, now I'll tell you whether the gauge group is it's uh, the gauge group is compact or the and actually, though we will not pause to look at it in, at the moment, um, there are interesting magnetic monopole solutions of this theory. We'll look at it at some point in this course. So, Kaluza line monopoles. Okay? And we will exactly the and exactly the out quantization. Okay? Which in some sense is an explanation of the compactness. Okay. Um, so, okay. That's all I wanted to say about charge fields. Um, is this clear? Is what we've done today? Okay? So, we have interesting new phenomenology where any theory of gravity will be compacted by a uh, circle, more generally, in a torus. We can new gauge fields. Momentum in the original, in, in, in these compact directions is charged to this gauge Now, of course, since <coughs> overall momentum is concerned, you can't separate momentum from the scalar field from momentum in the gravity and so on, it's so clear in general terms that any field, whether scalar or vector or the gravity or not, that carries momentum in the extra direction will also be charged under this gauge field. Okay? It's more complicated to work out because it's more complicated to solve the equations of a gravity. Exactly. Gauge transformations and the translations in the extra direction. Exactly. Gauge transformations are translations in the x direction and it's generated. Exactly. Okay? So, exactly. So, as I know, it's so clear just from the from the structure that momentum in the extra di direction abstractly, no matter what carries it, would play the role of charge. Okay, great. Now what's the next? Uh, what's the next thing I want? The next thing I want to do was to, un uh, was to understand how uh, okay, let's start with gravity, the gravity concept. Now the, the three fields I want to understand. First is now the scale of the second was the graviton you know, the graviton itself, graviton Lillipan system, and the third is the beam. Okay, so let's let's try to understand the graviton. Okay. So what we're gonna do is now use without the uh, effective Kaluza time reduction for the graviton. Here I'm going to appeal to one, it can be shown that. Basically because the yeah, algebra is too big. Right. So the one it can be shown that that I'm going to do is that if you take the metric of the form that we have done at the beginning and we, we calculate the Ricci scale of that metric. Okay? Then the answer you get can, is equal to the Ricci scale of the lower dimension, G, the small G view, minus 2 e to the power minus sigma and then square of e to the power sigma. So you want it R D if the Yeah. Uh, R big R is the Ricci scalar in the big theory in, in all dimensions. R D is the dimensionally reduced. It's the Ricci scalar built out of little g. Okay. Uh, let's let's call this let's give it a better name. Let's call this R uh, 26 and let's call this R25. You know, it works more generally in the basic space, but just, just to make it clear. Okay? And minus 1 by 4 um, e to the power of the one. Alright, while the derivation of this is 
a straightforward ex exercise. It's a pain in the neck, as you can imagine. Okay, and we're not going to try to. Well, some things are obvious. Right? It's obvious that this expression, which is invariant under all coordinate invariances, should give you something that does not depend on a, but only on s. This thing is two derivatives, so this thing has to be two derivatives, and so on. So all the simple consistency checks will allow you to fix what the form that it could have taken up to some coefficients. Okay, and computing the coefficients would be a big thing. Okay, but basically the structure sounds very reasonable. I'm not going to verify it. Apparently, to say I've never done it under uh, uh, by dynamic calculation. Okay, but assuming this, now let's go. Okay, so let's. Uh, Let's start with the action, which was square root g. Now this is the big G, remember, times r 26 times. Let's put it in the term, even for minus two. Okay, and uh, and plug, uh, plug in this this expression. So firstly, what does square root g become? Square root g, if you remember, became uh, uh, integral square root little g and it passed c. Okay? Then this r26 we just got, it's r25 um, minus 2 e to the power minus sigma times del squared e to the power minus sigma. Okay? And then we have Minus e to the power two c to the power four. F mu, of course, you understand, right? It's the gate field that I've picked. That is everything has a minus two phi. Thank you. E to the power two phi minus two phi plus. Okay? So let's define a new effective 
the total. 5 times 25 is equal to 5, which is 26 dimension the total, minus sigma by 2. Okay? So the good feeling
experience of the problem are this low dimensional delta plot and that kind of thing and this sigma okay now there's something that here might be worrying you it might be worried that this these two kinetic terms are opposite sign so you might think that one of them therefore is the wrong sign kinetic term but that's not true because rem remember that this guy is multiplied by the e to the power minus phi 25 so when you find the equation of motion of this phi 25 you get additional term from integrating by parts here and both of them obey ordinary sign you know effectively ordinary sign kinetic it, let me say that again. If you redefine, if you define a new field, uh, let's say um, e to the power minus, you know, if you if you want to find a new field such that this this thing is not there behind its kinetic term, you would say that zeta say is equal to e to the power minus phi. Then this will be proportional to del mu zeta del mu zeta. Okay, but you get the right side, right side kinetic term when you work that out. Okay, so sorry, sorry, I said that. Sorry, 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 I said that. If basically, what you want to do is to define canonical fields for everything. So suppose you went to Einstein, right? Sorry, if suppose you went to Einstein. Okay, suppose you define a new metric such that the, the uh, the Ricci scalar for that new metric didn't have an e to the power minus 525 in front of it. So that's some conformal transformation of the circuit. Okay, then the kinetic term for the Dilton, the graviton is just standard, and the kinetic term for the Dilton will also be standard. Go away. Okay, but you see that that, that new Ricci scalar, the rescaled Ricci scalar has extra contributions proportional to del squared of phi, which when combined with this term gives you the correct sign. Sorry, since I'm sorry for the wrong statement. Well, uh, uh, so the, the net point is that because of this e to the power minus 2, 525, every field has a right side kinetic term. Though it's not manifest. It's not manifest in this way. Okay? Uh, another way to say it is that this, this problem of the wrong side kinetic term existed also in the parent theory. So whatever solves it in that parent theory, it also solves it in the current theory. It's no, no new issue. Minus one dimension metric, scalar field for size of circle and gauge field, and you see what kinetic terms look like. Um, now the scalar field could easily be even charged. So it's, uh, you can play with the motion Okay. Uh, the last thing to say is that because uh, this form is exactly the same as the parent form we started with, if you now dimensionally reduce further, you can do that reverse. Okay. So the if you dimensionally reduce you know, down p dimensions, the new d dimensional dilaton, the new effective dilaton, will be the old one minus sigma 1 by 2, minus sigma 2 by 2, minus sigma 3 by 2, okay? okay? And you'll have many new, many new scalar fields, uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, which are like this. Okay, the last uh, dimension, uh, the, the, last, the last thing that, we, that I wanted to work out was, 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 was b field. Uh, in due time, I'm going to give this for you as an exercise. Okay? So, uh, uh, well, let me, let me sketch the answer and leave the working out of the details for you as an exercise. Okay. So, suppose we have this B mu. Okay? Now, um, B mu, let's, let's say we start with B and N. Now, there are two options. The M, M N, and B could be either D, I mean I26, or it could be mean. Since it's symmetric, since the spin is anti-symmetric, can't have two of them be mean. Okay? So there are two options that either B mu D or there's B mu D. Okay? This let's call a mu prime. Okay? Uh, this now behaves like an honest gauge field in one other How do we see that? The gauge symmetry of uh, uh, of B 
was b prime is equal to b plus d of uh, lambda b, where lambda is any one form. Now, an arbitrary one form, you know, d of lambda where lambda is any one form. Now, an arbitrary one form is lambda is equal to exactly some some chi times dx d, okay, plus uh, um, chi times dx d plus b mu times dx mu. The number three one form. Let's take d of that and assume as we've been doing, nothing depends on. Uh, well, actually, for the statement we don't need to assume that. So uh, let's take d of that. Okay, there will be a, a term here proportional to d chi weight dx d. Since it's anti-symmetric in d chi, we don't need the derivative in the d direction. So that will be d mu chi times dx mu weight dx d. Okay, so the change in b mu d is exactly like the change of a mu under the gauge transformation generated by the gauge parameter chi. This is shift by d mu chi. Okay, so the gauge symmetry, you see this gauge symmetry was gauge symmetry under a 26 parameter group. Because there's lambda, there's one form that components one to 26. 25 of these 26 parameter groups just generate gauge transformations here, of this period. You know, of, of, the, of this, this period. The 26 guy generates a, not a one form gauge event, but a normally function gauge event. For the effective ordinary gauge field in your brain. Is this clear? So, under Kaluza Klein reduction, the B mu mu field in 26 dimensions gives rise to a B mu field in 25 dimensions plus an A mu field, an ordinary gauge field. Okay, now, uh, but the exercise I want to leave for you is to work out what happens to the yeah, the original kinetic term of the theory was square root g h mu nu lambda h mu nu lambda. This was kinetic term in higher dimensions. I want you to, as an exercise, to work out the kinetic term in lower dimensions. You know, the dimensionally reduced kinetic term. Uh, uh, we'll briefly, so, so please try to do that in the next class. We'll briefly discuss the answer next class. And then next class we'll move on actually considering string theory rather than field theory. Uh, Okay, uh, something I should say about this B field is that, so we've got a new gauge field here, uh, and you might wonder what is charged up in this gauge field. Now we've already seen last time, uh, we've probably seen this lecture, momentum around this circle <coughs> is effective charge under the gauge field that came from the ground. So it would seem like too much of that also gave us the gauge field that came around, uh, that came from this B field, and it's not true. You take a mode that has momentum around the circle, there's no sense.